Welcome to Outside Game, the podcast. I am Keith Bullock, the host with the most, along with my main man, Don Povia. Mr. Monday Night, the host with the most nicknames that he gives to himself. He got to I mean, bury that joke. You got to sometimes. There. I'm gonna see, I'm gonna keep saying it. I'm not gonna <laughs> stop saying it. <laughs> That's your thing. We are back this week, and we have a guest this week. Uh, so we'd like to welcome to the show, Mr. Zach Hampel. Well, hey, thanks. Great you're, to be here. You're welcome. But before we get going and, and do a proper intro, we're going to do a little icebreaker we're playing around with. I'm yeah. already nervous. Right, yeah, you, should you, sh you shouldn't be. We are, too, because this is like, hey, you're, you're our guinea pig. pig. <laughs> we're about to see how this goes. Bring it. Nice. So we're going to play, what is this? Taboo. It's taboo. All right. You're, are you familiar with the game Taboo? I've heard of it. That's about it. Don, you explain it, bro. All right. So Keith has a word that you have to guess person place or thing oh. he has a list of words that he's not allowed to say to describe that and you get 60 seconds to guess damn so that means i gotta be good right that's that's the key okay all right let's go ready go uh so woman oprah winfrey um from england the dancer one of her Mm. One of her uh, posh spice, uh, ginger spice, uh, scary nope. spice. No, nope. keep going and you will get it. I don't know. Wait, what are their real names? I don't know. Say their real names. You know the oh. most famous one. The most famous one that's married to the one married to the soccer. A player. handsome guy. Oh man, did oh. I just say that? My wife wasn't. As... Oh, she's not a fan. Victoria. A fan. Oh wow. Oh Odell. Bend Victoria it. Beckham. There yeah! See, that was easy. Boom. <laughs> I think that you know was more saying? Zach than it was Keith. I mean, yeah, the, the, guy is, <laughs> the guy was on. So, look, now you can go through here. Nah, let's, let's move on. All right, yeah, fine. All right. We're, 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 blaming, we're blaming Nando for that, but we can also thank Nando for having us. Well, we're going to start. We, I think that was a cool way to start. We're oh. trying to figure out, a, you know, our podcast is new, so we're just trying to throw some new wrinkles in to see what goes. Yeah, you're you know number four, but that was number one. Clean up hitter. There you go. Oh, number four. Knocked it out of the park. <laughs> Let's talk some baseball. Keith, why so, you tee it up? Because you already so, know where he's born. Yeah, so if down. those who aren't familiar with Mr. Hampo, he is the infamous Baseball collector, how would you describe yourself? I would describe yourself, I would describe you as the guy who has collected over 10,000 baseballs. Is that correct? It's over 11,000 now. But low, yeah. Over 11,000 baseballs Accurate. and over well, 55, maybe probably over 60 stadi different stadiums. Right in there, 57 different major league stadiums. Man, that is pretty amazing. My first thing is how did you get into collecting baseballs i was watching baseball when i was four maybe five years old the first time i was aware that major league baseball even existed and the cameras would show balls flying into the crowd and fans would snag these baseballs and celebrate like it was the best moment of their lives and that made some kind of impression on me and i was dying to catch a ball for myself went to my first game when i was six and I went home empty-handed, not only that game, but for the next six years. Wow. And finally, when I was 12, I went to batting practice for the first time. And that's when I got my first couple of baseballs. And my dad always described that moment as if it was a baby shark tasting blood for the first time. <laughs> Sounds pretty accurate. So for, at what, the age of six? What, what stadium was that? I got my first baseballs at Shea Stadium, Shea but my stadium. first game was at Yankee Stadium. See, that, that's that's the key, though, is, is batting practice. I loved and learned that, right, going to the vet, and you can just go right down there behind the uh, the dugouts and stuff. But I, I, was, more was, I was more place. looking for autographs with my baseball cards as opposed to there you go. as opposed to baseballs, and I didn't even think of it. <laughs> the vet was tough, though, for anybody who remembers the layout there because you had all this dead space yeah. behind the outfield walls. And home runs really had to be hit quite a distance to even reach the seats, which were like 20 feet up above the outfield wall. Oh, so, so the batting practice, you're catching home run balls. You're not down, say, by, oh. by the, you know, the left field line you know, asking for, Bro. Asking for balls. Toss-ups, home runs, you name it. Bro, you haven't seen this guy in action? I've seen it. I'm, he, I'm going like, back look, to the early days. Look, I'll get back to the early days, but since you brought it up, like – I was always curious the method of your madness, and I checked out the time you went to, uh, I think it was Nationals Park, and that was pretty That was pretty entertaining because I saw how you would start 
on one side of the field during BP and you would go to the other side of the field during like, yo, you have a real system down. Like you understand these ballparks. You understand, like I never knew there was two different batting practices. Like explain um, the process of when you get to the field and you're about to start collecting balls. But I also want to say, I also thought initially you had over 10,000 home runs collected. I was like, yo. So explain your process and everything that it entails, if you don't mind, for our listeners. Yeah, sure. So I think most people don't realize that if you have any normal ticket to a baseball game, you can get there early for batting practice. Every major league stadium opens at least 90 minutes before game time. Mm. Some open two hours early, some two and a half. Sometimes if you have a season ticket, you get to enter a little extra early. But the point is that you can show up without having to buy an extra fancy ticket. And the players are out there warming up, assuming it's not raining or anything like that. Or sometimes if it's a day game, the players want to sleep in and they won't hit. But most games, they're a batting practice. Security is pretty chill. It's not that crowded. And you can run around and go to different sections and catch balls and ask the players to throw baseballs into the crowd. And the home team always goes first. Then the visitors hit. And that can last for sometimes an hour and a half. If a stadium opens two and a half hours early, they'll hit till about an hour before game time. Are you scouting not just the ballparks, but the individual batters themselves? Does that dictate where you're going? or Sometimes, yeah. From watching baseball on TV, just countless hours and games over the years, you get to see what the players do. And you see which players have a crazy amount of power. Fans always hug the first few rows in batting practice. So you know that if that big guy gets up there and the first 10 rows are crowded, but then there's a walkway maybe a dozen rows back, hang out near the walkway. You'll have room to run, and they probably will reach you. So there's a lot of strategizing that goes into it for sure. That's crazy. What is your fate? What has been, like, no, let me backtrack a little bit. As a kid, when you caught, I cheated a little bit, you caught uh, Giambi and you caught Matt Damon, John, Johnny Damon. Johnny Damon. We're confusing our Damons. I'd yeah, love yeah, yeah. To, to catch a Matt Damon home run. That would be oh, very yeah, valuable. He's an actor, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Goodwill Hunting. But yeah, so in those moments, you caught those first your first two balls back to back nights. Explain how you felt and how gratifying it was, and what did you do after you caught those balls? Yeah, so that was the last week of Yankee Stadium the old stadium in 2008 in September. And yeah, one night I caught a Jason Giambi home run front row in the bleachers and right center, little jumping catch, you know, not, not top 10 worthy, but it was a nice (laughs) little play out there. And did you have the leather? Or are you going bare? Oh, I always bring a glove. Yeah, now he has his glove. And they're for all the people that are like, Oh, if you're over 12, you can't bring a glove and this (laughs) and that. It's like, great. You leave your glove at home. That makes it easier for me. (laughs) Everybody wins. Um, and after I caught that ball, Just in that split second, I was like, oh, my friends might be watching on TV or family, and I'm going to do a stupid little dance. And I did that little butter churn, cabbage patch, whatever you Uh, want to call it. Yeah, nah, I can dig it. You you hit him with the... (laughs) There it is. That's it. (laughs) Except you're already making it look better than I ever could. It's all good. You were still swaggy. (laughs) So I did that, and of course the cameras saw it, and the announcers talked about it, and it was funny. The next night... Caught a Johnny Damon home run in pretty much the same spot. That was actually a very good play because I leaned way over a railing for it. Hard to see on the replay because I was wearing a black T-shirt. Right. That's another lesson. Don't wear dark colors. It's Stand hard to out. see your exactly. Even a white shirt or some neon or whatever. But made a good play out there. And as soon as I caught it and sort of stood upright from leaning over this railing, I was like, I got to do the same dance. Maybe like they'll recognize right, me. Right, right. So I did. And then that became... I'm not even kidding when I say it was like an international news story. Like, fan <laughs> catches home runs back-to-back nights, does the stupid dance, whatever. I mean, I'm telling you, like, Japanese yeah. TV was interviewing me at the stadium. And, like, I was on CNN International. My friends in Europe were like, yeah, I just saw your dumb ass. Like, on the TV, <laughs> like, what are you doing? So it was pretty crazy how big that story got. And then a week after that, week and a half later, I caught the last yeah. home run that the Mets ever hit at Shea Stadium. That's awesome. And I was really buried in the crowd for that one, so you couldn't really tell it was me, obviously. But then word got out about that, and then you could see me in the replay freaking out, and then the Tonight Show with Jay Leno got in touch, and they flew me out to California. Yeah. And, had me, and it's like, wow, my silly little hobby of catching baseballs turned into this you so, know, so is the hobby phenomenon. about 
catching baseballs or, or the baseball games? Do you go there early on? I'm talking early on when when you first got that that taste of that blood. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's I'm going to this game. Game be damned. I'm coming home with a souvenir. That was definitely my mentality. Okay. For a while, the pursuit of baseballs took over my love of baseball. I mean, I always loved it. I still read box scores every morning. Even if I wasn't going to games, I'd watch them on TV. But when I was at the games, I was there to catch baseballs. Like, do your friends, your friends what ever friends? see What friends? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For a while, that was, that was true. Really? Oh, yeah. In high school, yeah, no. You So, like, you got that engulfed that, like... You know, it, it kind of took. Oh, you were you were a dick. You were an addict. That's what you were. That's an understatement. Wow. Yeah. What was your being a New Yorker? Are you a Mets or Yankees fan? I grew up as a Mets fan. <laughs> you can't switch. He's a Mets. You fan. can't. Switch. And at this point, if you'll let me finish, <laughs> <laughs> Keith, I actually don't have a favorite team. Okay, that's fair. I'm really just a fan of the sport and of individual players, which. A lot of people think is weird, and they're welcome to think it's weird, and maybe it is weird, but that's me. I've been to a zillion stadiums, and it's like, you know, you go to Milwaukee, and it's like, Brewers fans, the best fans in baseball, right. and then I'm back at Yankee Stadium, Yankee fans, the best fans. It's like, okay, we're all the best fans. We're right. all baseball fans here. But the Mets Mets fans, it's it's kind of been hard for us. But um, Oh, you're but a Mets fan. I'm a Mets fan. I grew up in Rockland County, across the GW, about probably 35 minutes from here. But I can relate to, like, favorite players because uh, growing up, uh, my favorite team was the 49ers because the first Super Bowl I saw was when they played in 84, when they played the Dolphins. And Ronnie Lott became my favorite player. And then – Bo Jackson became my favorite player. And then, you know what I'm saying? And then being from New York, I've always rooted for the Giants over the Jets, but I've never been a fan of either team. Obviously, when the Giants were in those Super Bowls, I'm rooting for the Giants over whoever they're playing. But I will say now, at 42, as a New Yorker, just because I played for the Giants one year, one one bum year, <laughs> <laughs> Giants are my favorite New York football team. I can say that I that's fair. root for the Giants, but more so um, when it comes to basketball and baseball, I just I'm, I'm more I'm more about the players. So I, I can totally understand. Who is your overall? Give me your top three overall baseball players. Favorite ever. It was Cal Ripken Jr. for the longest time, but Mike Trout has taken over. Mike Trout. Okay. I caught Mike Trout's first career home run. In 2011, in Baltimore, Camden Yards, my favorite stadium. Future Philly. What makes Camden Yards your favorite stadium? Well, the layout is just incredible for what I do. I also think it's beautiful. The whole right. less is more. It was the first sort of retro right. stadium in the new wave of ballparks that were built. But there's standing room down the right field line. The left field seats are very shallow. It's like 364 to the power alley. There's walkways all over the place. You, lateral movement is key. <laughs> lateral movement. I remember the first time I went to Camden Yards. So a guy named Dave Gallagher played for the White Sox, won a uh, state championship with my uncles. And we went to see the Bash Brothers play at Camden. When, oh, when he was playing, when he, So Dave was playing for the uh, the Orioles, and we're behind first base, probably in the upper deck. And I just remember remembering how massive Mark McGuire looked right below us, even though steroids will do that. We're in, the, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're in the upper deck there. Well, before we go on, Keith, who are your top three favorite players of all time? I, I only, only gave I only two. Named two. Go, only gave go, two. Go, go, go. And I was just going to say with Mike Trout. You know, he always remembered me as the guy that got his first home run, and oh, I gave him dope. that ball. And he he actually gave me a signed bat earlier this year awesome. as a thank you years later because I hadn't actually asked for anything at the time. Um, so he he replaced Cal because of that as my all time favorite right. player. And then I don't know number three. Let's go with Greg Maddox. Okay, I just nice. even when Maddox and the Braves came and played the Mets, and I was supposed to be a Mets fan, I found myself rooting for Greg Maddox because. <laughs> I dude, love those dude braids threw teams. like you know sixty three miles an hour and made everybody look bad. And I was, was just like, talking, I love this guy. I was just talking about. I just had this conversation last week. So I live in Tennessee now, and the Braves is is their baseball team. But that pitching staff of uh, Glavin, Smoltz, Maddox, um, and the thing for I think Steve I was, Avery, Steve yep, Avery, and I was talking about John Smoltz, how he has over two hundred career wins as a pitcher. And then Saves. to be able to adjust your game to go to the bullpen, which is something totally different, and dominate like that. Like, 
that that's pretty amazing. So is he one he's of a your? Decent, I think he's a decent commentator now too. Yeah, he's know? very people, good. People have their favorites and their guys that they hate, but I I thought Schmaltz was pretty good. No, he's a, he that's one. He's on one of my favorite teams. So I'll say my one of my favorite player, my top three. I'll say Dwight Gooden definitely was a Dr. K fan. I was at his no hitter in 1996 at the old Yankee Stadium. Yeah. Oh, Dwight Gooden. Um, I used to tell my friend, I just came off a secret. I've been lying to my friends for about 20 years. I used to tell them Ken Griffey Jr. was my cousin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't think they ever believed me, but I never denied it. And then I told them like five years ago, hey, guys, you know Ken Griffey Jr. isn't my cousin. They're like, no shit. <laughs> and I was like, I had you guys fooled. I didn't really have them fooled. Um, and then Barry Larkin. I was a, I, I really liked nice. Barry Larkin. I liked because he was a very good fielder. And he was very consistent, always hit about 300, you know, was very consistent. And now let me just give you a current one because you gave one. Um, Christian Yelich. I like Christian because um, I've seen his journey. I remember when I was still playing in the NFL, he was a, you know, small-time baseball. Might have been in college. I don't know what level he was at, but I always remember him being in um, proactive uh, training facility out there in Westlake, California, um, training, you know, obviously with the baseball players, but us football players would be in there and um, got a, you know, some time to just talk to him, just you know, as the baseball guys in there, and then you know, five, three years or four years later, however many years later, he's the league MVP, and I haven't seen him since, but I, I hope he remembers those <laughs> conversations because I'm gonna hit him up for some tickets one day. <laughs> there you go. There you go. What about you, Mike Schmidt? Um, all right, so I remember, here's my first stadium experience that I remember. Uh, we used to go with my dad and my uncle, uh, who was my godfather, and we would have these terrible, if you remember, the vet had that obstructive this, view. Oh, like I under say the 600 level, but not. No, it was like under the like outfield overpass. And so you basically are watching games on the TV right. that they had like hanging down there. But I remember he said, just remember that your godfather took you to see Pete Rose play baseball. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> so, uh, but Schmidt was always uh, my favorite as a younger. And then Ricky Henderson. I yeah. loved Ricky Henderson. I was a speed guy. Um, and I'll, I'll admit it. We, uh, we we met him not too long ago. But Lenny Dykstra in that, like, 92, 93, 94 Nails. run with the Phillies. Um, my next door neighbor, and, and just to kind of pivot too, like my next door neighbor was a Braves fan. And I'm like, how are you from Jersey? We get both media markets. You see Phillies, Mets, um, you know, Yankees. Uh, Yankees. And how are you a Braves fan? He's like, because I come home from school and TBS, we got these games on there. So oh, he growing from, up? Yeah, you grew up down so south. <laughs> no, because it was Superstation. It, oh. it was the national thing. So we always used to have – like home run derby in his backyard, it was Schmidt versus Dale Murphy, and right. then Murphy became a Philly, and I started being Dale Murphy just to piss him off. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> harsh. He hated that. Um, you know, yeah. I, I uh, and then I, I kind of had a thing. I liked Ripken. I played middle infield. I liked Ripken. I liked uh, Ryan Sandberg. Um, but yeah, I would say you just gave us five. No, but I'm just saying it evolves. I'm glad you pointed that out because I wanted to. <laughs> you gave us five. I'm not giving any current players. How about that? So I would say Henderson, Schmidt, and uh, Lenny Dykstra. So you say Mike Trout gave you, um, you know, a sign base. What is that? Would you say that's your best piece of uh, memorabilia? One of them for sure. That with, with a personal touch. I mean, yeah. I, I've caught some home runs that are worth more money. And, Who, and we're certainly harder to a- acquire, you know. So, what is the which ball do you own that is worth the most? And what besides the Mike Trout ball that you caught? And I'm, I don't even know if that's your most special ball. But which is the most special ball that you ever caught as well? A Rod's three thousandth career wow. hit is definitely the biggest one. Mike Trout's first home run would probably be the second one, and I gave both of those balls to the players who hit them. Right. And I kind of regret it, but I kind of don't. But I still, it's fun to think about how much those baseballs would sell for, hypothetically, if I still had them and I sent them to auction today. Yeah, but you have a story now, right? You, you, oh, yeah. Nobody can take that away. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of getting older and in that mindset, you can't take this stuff with you. I mean, I collected 
anything that was remotely collectible yeah, and mad held on to it. Cards. And then when I got married and moved in, my mom said, take all these foot lockers and put them in your own house now. And now my wife says, take all these foot lockers. I don't care what you do with them, but get rid of them. And, and being able to let go now and, and to people that appreciate them. Right now it's my nephew. Um, you know, my friends has twin sons, gave them to him. She sends me a picture, literally thousands of baseball cards that he's stacking up with his grandfather. But to your point, you've done so much. People know you're the one that got these things. Um, I think the fact that you, you gave them to these guys, who cares how much they're worth? Because Well, that's, that's true. I mean, I, one of the books I wrote, I researched the top 10 highest selling baseballs of all time. And it's that one from the Sandlot, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and number 10 on the list, I believe, was Barry Bonds' 715th career home run, which put him ahead of Babe Ruth on the all time list. And that sold for a little over $200,000. Was that the one that the. Somebody bought that, right? And wanted to brand it with the asterisks. Was that? I believe that was the, the final home run okay. of his. Or no, that was 756, I guess, that put him ahead of Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron, okay. A lot of famous Barry Bonds home runs. Right. And I always wondered, like, would my A-Rod ball have cracked the top 10? Right. But, you know, I got to do a press conference with A-Rod <sighs> at Yankee Stadium. Money man. can't buy that. That's exactly that's what my pretty cool. That's, got that's, the story. That's the experience, <laughs> Like, man. I could still have the baseball sitting on my shelf, which would be cool, but right. instead, It's almost like these things are now in historical record that you've done yeah. these things. And the and Yankees... Holding on to that ball... No, no, he's a whole... Yeah. Like, his Wikipedia page is long right. as shit. Go. And has some misinformation. Um, yeah, they always do it. Yeah, they, they always do usually misrepresent unless you get a real company to do it for you. <laughs> they just... Make stuff up. Um, what, can I ask you a question? Absolutely. What is the biggest untruth that has been reported about you in your oh, career? Oh, man. Something just like 100% wrong. Like, how do you even report that? Because it's the opposite of <sighs> Bro, the, the time that they said that I robbed a cab driver in Nashville. I swear to God, that has to be the biggest untruth ever. So here's the story. I'm commentating. <laughs> Lay it on us, yeah. I'm doing commentary for Titans game preseason games, right? So after the game, you know, I meet up. Um, I'm just two years out of the league, I think. So then I go meet up with um, some of my former, like Chris Johnson, some of my former teammates. Um, and it's about like 1.45. And they were going to after hours, after party. I'm like, nah, I'm taking my ass home. Like, because I just comment, commentated, I'm ready to I'm going home. And I go to a cab driver who was sitting out in front of the place we're at. I was like, bro, I'll give you $100 to take me. Because, you know, sometimes cab drivers, they don't, I don't want to go that far. You know, some make it worth his while. I'll give you $100 to take me to, to Brentwood, which is about 20, 25 minutes away where I live. And the cab driver says, okay. You know, and I hand him money. And at that time, you know, because I'm leaning through the passenger window, someone calls my name. I turn around. I talk to them for a minute. And then I go to get in the car. He's like, I have a fare already. I can't take you. I have a fare already. I'm like, what are you talking about? I just gave you my money. You got my money in my in your hand. He's like, I have a fare. So being I being who I am, I reach in the car and I snatch my money out of his hand. I was like, well, give me my fucking money, right? <laughs> and then I just leave and I walk across the street to try and catch up with my boys to get a ride from them. Two minutes later. Here comes these two police officers, no. and the guy. I see the guy kind of behind him, and it. You know, you remember when we were kids? It, did you watch wrestling at all? No. Well, you remember. You remember I the mean, vision of Hulk, of Hulk Hogan ripping his shirt. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. So his shirt is ripped as if he ripped like I ripped like someone ripped it like Hulk Hogan. And there's a new law. There's a law in Nashville passed because of this, because he's done it to Apparently other people. He was like before. shaking down like politicians. Yeah, he was doing it to politicians, claiming that you know they did him unjust or whatever. But anyway, yeah, I got locked. I got taken to jail that night. I got taken to jail, and I'm like, first of all, I have a twenty thousand dollar Rolex on. I got diamond earrings and I took a hundred and I got five hundred dollars in my pocket but yet I took a hundred dollars from this cab driver so yeah I say that was a, a terrible 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 story because at the time I was doing media and stuff I lost some gigs because of that and you know it just whatever you know you get over it but that was that stupid sucks. that was wah, wah. because wah, it, that, wah. They, they don't care about what really happened at the end of the day, that's a story. Keith Bullock ro robs a, 
Rob's a cab driver. And then I got to hear from my friends in New York that fucking Boomer Esiason's over there talking shit. Like, this guy made all this money, and he's robbing someone for $100? Hey, Boomer, use your fucking head. Sorry. <laughs> I've been holding that in for a while. Let it out, man. I'm I'm here for you. We have, we don't have a time limit, right? I appreciate Just it. Let it flow. Yeah, I appreciate it. Let it flow. Well, speaking got of which, worked up on that. You brought this up. Exactly. Just got hot in here, right? It did. <laughs> so, what are what are some of the uh, the misconceptions that people have of you? Well, on Wikipedia or, or that otherwise. he steals from the kids. Well, there's that, and that I knock over kids. Yes, that's what I saw. That he knocks kids over. I have saw you, you ever, actually you giving ever, balls to little kids. Over a kid? I have not. Okay. I've actually seen him on the record shagging not knocked over kids or an adult. They just gotta get their glove or any pets. <laughs> There's like bark at the park. People bring their dogs. I've never knocked over a dog for a baseball either. Nice. But on Wikipedia, um, and I I haven't looked at it in a few months, so it I, I assume it's still there. But it did recently say that I'm banned from three major league stadiums. It does say that stadiums. because I wrote that down as one of my topics to ask you about. How do you, you I tell the no tell that story? So the first the, are you banned first and foremost? No. All right. So in Zach 20, is not banned, everyone. In 2017 and 2018, I went to all 30 major league stadiums. Damn. And this and this article that they linked to was written even before that. So it's like mm, that's already and I even have videos on my YouTube channel of me at all 30 stadiums. So right. that's not true. <laughs> so the reason that this got misreported i have been ejected oh. from three stadiums oh. which is much different from being banned nice. and the story of the ejections met security they were out to get me in the 1990s <laughs> they that's I'd, when you were addicted yes um, <laughs> I'm still a, I'm his, still addicted his pictures up at all the turnstiles like don't let this guy in so you know i didn't when I was a teenager, I didn't used to give any baseballs away. Right. Now I give away most of them. Yeah, I see you. But, I've seen your but clips. But back in the day, I caught them, I kept them, and security didn't like that. And they thought it was their job to regulate how many baseballs I could catch. They would make up special rules for me. Where did, they you get a, did you get a roll on the back of the uh, ticket? You, <laughs> you were a, small a gangster. Public, I don't think so. Zach public enemy roll. number one, son. Pull out the, uh, the the magnifying glass and look right right below. Uh, look out for, for flying bats and balls and look out for Zach Hample. It got to the point where they basically said, the next ball you catch, you have to give away. And then I would catch one and be like, you can't tell me. Like, this is not a rule. And they're like, either give us the ball or you're out of here. And it's like, I will leave the stadium how before. Does, how does this get elevated because to they this were, point? Because they were a bunch of goons. That actually made me hate the Mets, uh, the way I was treated at their stadium. I feel you. That and also liking Greg Maddox and just liking players more than teams. But I was treated so badly. It got to the point at Shea. I was ejected once. Security walked over. They said, can we see your ticket? I showed them my ticket. I was not in my ticketed seat. They ejected me. Wow. So that happened four times at Shea. Really got to hate the Mets as a result. So that was one stadium. Not banned. They right. were just like, you know, they walked me out. I, I just whatever. can't get over how ridiculous. And then I went back the next day. Just the whole concept. And I was is. like, you know, and I'm a teenager. Like, I was brought to tears by the way they treated me. It was, right. it was really bad. Uh, I was ejected from Nationals Park. Because I was seeing the Dodgers, I think, in 2012. And the Dodgers had commemorative baseballs for their 50th year at Dodger Stadium, right? 1962 to 2012. Got a bunch of commemorative balls. I was with someone who had club access. We went up to the club. There was this fancy area, this carpet. I laid out my baseballs on the carpet with the logos face up, taking some pictures from my blog. A police officer walks up. He's like, uh... Uh, excuse me, what are you doing over here? I was like, oh, I'm sorry, am I in the way? I'm just grabbing a few pictures. He's like, I'm going to need you to wait here for a moment. I'm like, is something wrong? He's like, yeah, there's a report of you selling baseballs. <laughs> and it escalated, and there were I ended up being surrounded by six or eight security guards, supervisors, police officers. The head of security came. Wow. Do you think they this, insisted? Yo. Do you think that one was because somebody was suspicious of what you're doing at the time or because did they do you they think didn't they, know who I was. That's what I'm saying. They, they didn't know this was Zach. And it's just like guy. you with the Rolex. Like I have this Rolex. Why would I steal a hundred dollars? I told them 
guys, I caught Mike Trout's first home run last year, and I gave it to him. Right. Like, if I wanted to make money from That's selling baseballs, sell. I'd save that one and sell it for six figures someday, you right. know? I, and I had never sold a ball, and I, and they're like, well, we got a report that you're selling baseballs, and they ejected me. Wow. So least, that, that was zero due process. At least it didn't go on your record. These things. Hey, if you were black, they would have taken you to jail. <laughs> Might have if you were at the too. vet, we would have had a jail in the <laughs> Might basement. Might have got shot, too. Hold up. He's got baseballs. Um, and then, three. And then the third ejection was in Philly at Citizens Bank Park. Um, I committed the horrible crime of sitting about eight seats over from my ticketed seat. I had a seat in the middle of a section. It was half empty. I sat on the stairs. Same row, same section. And somehow security saw me move over after they walked me down to my seat. They insisted that I sit in my seat, so I moved over, and then I moved back. It sort of became a whole thing. I actually caught a home run that game, and then that kind of drew their attention back on me, and they they were threatening me and all this stuff. If you're out of your seat one more time, you're out of here. The security supervisor then walked up the steps. I turned to my friend, and I said, man, security is being a bunch of fill-in-the-blank today. <laughs> It was a private conversation. A beer vendor overheard me, ratted me out to security, wow. and they ejected me for the fa- the bad language that I was reported to have used. <laughs> By that rationale, half the stadium should be ejected every game. Yeah, it's true. So those were my three. You can throw batteries. The three stadiums that, that I've been ejected from. Talk smack about the. Uh, I told security. a reporter at some point. Yeah, I was you know ejected from three stadiums. Somehow that got translated into I'm banned right. from three stadiums. That got written by some stupid website called Fan Sided. <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call them out. Yeah, you should. Why not? And then Fox Sports picked up the Fan Sided piece, and yeah, they they're, published they're it. They're aggregated, so they probably just pulled the same story. Right? And uh, I actually got the article taken down, but then the Wayback Machine keeps an, an archive of it. So evidently Wikipedia links to the archive of this yeah. false story saying I'm banned from Stadia. It's... Yeah, it's really know crappy. better than me. Yeah, no, it's really crappy. Do you have any? Do you get any love at any stadiums? Are there any stadiums that love to see you when you get there and might even roll out the red carpet? Or well, uh, that happens at every stadium. Oh, nice. Pretty much. I nice. mean, there's there have been a few ushers and guards here and there that had it out for me, but I haven't been kicked out of a game. That was 2013 in Philly. I've been to about 600 games since then without incident. Um, of all the things to be notorious for. Nah, he's no, right? public like, enemy. They got him public enemy number one because he's sitting four seats away. You don't have a hot dog. <sighs> but, yeah, there's <laughs> there's guards in every stadium that I go to. I mean, not everyone because some places I only go once a year and I'm not really that well known. But a lot of places the employees are like, anytime you want to come down to my section, you're welcome here. Let me know. And, yeah, it's so, no, 99.9% of my interactions in person at games are positive. I probably have a hundred to two hundred people on average recognize me per game and come up to me. A lot of whom are employees. So if you figure I'm going to a hundred games a year, that's ten to twenty thousand people a year who are approaching me. And there may be a handful of them who say something rude. That's so, a pretty good percentage. So uh, and it's always at Yankee Stadium in yeah, right field. Makes sense. Bleacher you, creatures. You, you go there. You go there the most. <laughs> yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I remember you talking about um, the – no, was that you? But anyway, you were collecting balls. You started pretty much in the 90s. So you were through that whole era of baseball. And then fast forward to now, the balls are jumping out of the park again. It's crazy. Um, what is – what do you think – well, do you think it's more with the balls right now? Because we kind of know what it was back then. What do you think is leading to um, the balls taking off so much? There's definitely something going on with the baseballs. I sent some baseballs from this year and last year to an astrophysicist who was dissecting them and analyzing them. Uh, So I can't really speak so much to the scientific part of things. But as a baseball fan who's been to all these stadiums and more than 1,700 major league games, yeah, there are baseballs regularly landing in places nowadays where – Five, ten years ago, you'd maybe see a few all-season land there. Second deck at Citizens Bank Park in left field. Mm -hmm. That's a shot. That's like 20 rows back and 15 feet up. 
Yeah, and they now made, every, and they made right field real short, so Jim Tomey back in the day can just pop them out too. So well, that, Tomey hit them all over the yeah. place, but yeah, I mean there there are baseballs that regularly go in the second deck in batting practice every day. Practically, you'll see some, and it used to be like that was so rare to see balls go up there. I was I was kind of getting at this too, but uh, in addition to the balls being just all the stadiums are what they what do they call band boxes, right? Yeah, just exactly. Small stadiums that are just setting up for that long ball game. I actually liked Marlins Park when it opened because it was so hard to hit <laughs> home cavernous. runs there. You'd see a lot of triples and sort of the the rawness of baseball right. like it was meant to be, right. like more skill. Like I, right. I don't like games when it's like six to four and you look at the box score and every run scored it because of a home, home run. run. Right, right, right. But of course, you know, they're changing the dimensions there and other places and it's – they try to build places big. Even Comerica Park in Detroit, they had to move in left field and put the bullpens there and – Everywhere. I want, I want to go back to the, the notorious stuff. And he said, you know, there's not a lot of haters, but there are haters. There are right? a that, lot online. Right. That, that's where I was going, right? Yeah. The, the online haters. How do you tune that out? I mean, Keith, you're a professional athlete, right? You're going to have opposing teams. You're going to have your team when you're when you're not doing so well, right? People are going to get on your case. But you're just a dude catching baseballs. like, And, and then you have this Viratol and lies, and people take the but, time to write stories and Wikipedia pages about but you. But the thing is, he's not just a dude catching baseballs anymore. He started off as a dude catching baseballs. Well, now you're an author. You're uh, yeah, but like he's, he's I'm a YouTuber. He's obviously, he's obviously <laughs> has people out for him. So yeah, to that. Yeah, to people who don't know me and maybe only look at my Wikipedia and find some crappy negative article, I'm the dude that. Knocks kids over, right. steals baseballs, held A Rod's ball hostage, <laughs> doesn't have a job, you know, is, is a virgin, lives in his mom's basement. Right. Um, You're a blogger, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So, That's how I a, and is banned from three stadiums. Wow, he must be awful if he's been banned from three stadiums. Do you have an arch nemesis? Do you have somebody that when you get to the stadium that you said you've been over to over <laughs> 1700? So, maybe like. 600 of the games, you get there, you're in your spot, you're getting ready, and you look over and you see this guy. And you're like, you guys just make eye contact and you know what it is, or no one really infringes on your territory. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> or does no one really infringe on your territory? <laughs> right. Like, bitch, I got you. I see you. <laughs> um, there have been many guys like that over the years, many of whom come and go. They'll just kind of crash the scene for a season or two and – and then people, you know, they grow up, they go off to college, they get married, they have jobs, they move, lives change, priorities change, I get that. It's even changed for me, and there have been a number of times when I've tried to leave all this nonsense behind, but then for various reasons, whether I wrote a book or I'm doing a YouTube thing or I get a sponsor or I catch some historic home run ball, I get sucked back into the vortex. But there are some guys who've definitely stuck with this over many, many years and I'm friendly with them. There's no hate like that. Um, one of my great friends here in New York named Greg, he averages so many baseballs per game. He's like the numbers guy. But he's pretty much only free on Fridays to go to games. <laughs> wow. And I love him. We hang out all the time. And we go out of our way to make sure we don't end up at the same games. <laughs> Because we're just going to end up competing with each other. That's and awesome. listen, I taught him everything he knows. Thank you very much. <laughs> but, you know, we were both in London this year for the Yankees mm. and Red Sox getting in each other's way. We were both <laughs> we were both in Japan in March for the A's and Mariners Damn. at the Tokyo Dome getting in each other's way. We were both at, at the game in Omaha over the summer in each other's way. So we're, we're going to be at the big ones where it's like this is the one time we can be at this stadium. We're both going to be in Iowa next year. For the Yankees and White Sox, assuming we can get tickets for that. What is a Japanese base? How does a Japanese baseball experience um, compare? Well, obviously it was um, American, it was Major League Baseball. Yeah, it was a over major there. American game, but how does the Japanese yeah, stadium? Sure. No, the stadium experience compare to um, you know over here? Obviously, it's totally different because when the NFL, I, I travel to London when the NFL goes over there. And, um, you know, the U.K. crowd just cheers differently. They're unfamiliar with the sport, not as familiar as we are in the States. But baseball in Japan is huge. So is there much of a difference in the interaction from Japanese stadiums and um, American stadiums? One thing I really noticed, and I was there in 2012 also when Major League Baseball opened that season. And it was even more noticeable then because there were fewer Americans who made that trip. Right compared to 2019, but it was so quiet during yeah. the games. 
it was like a tennis match. Yeah. And I just thought I'd have some fun with it. And I forget, who, maybe it was like Johnny Gomes playing left field back in 2012. And there were so few Americans there. You'd look around and like everyone's Japanese in the stands. Right. In and Japan. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, how dare they? Right, no. But, and, and they're just very quiet. And I also assumed before I went over there that everybody would speak English, but that wasn't the case. Right. So I just started, not heckling, but just like, hey, Johnny, baby, look alive, son. It's coming your way. Here we go, kid. All right. And I looked around, and people were horrified, just staring at this obnoxious American, mm, right? Awesome. And one other difference is that in batting practice, if you get a home run ball in Japan, stadium security comes over to you, and they ask for that baseball back. Wow. If a player throws you a ball, well, they, then they intended for you to have it so you can keep it. Huh. And I did a couple of videos from the games in Japan this year. What about a home run ball? During you... games, you can keep the baseballs. Okay. But my first video from Japan this year has like 2 million views. It just kind of went crazy because I titled it, like, why do stadium security guards confiscate baseballs at the Tokyo Dome? <laughs> why it was stadium like this, security guards dicks? <laughs> it was this very sort of catchy title that got people's attention. And I caught an Ichiro batting wow. practice home run. At his last, you know, major league series ever, because he retired after that. Right. And I could have done a little switcheroo and, you know, swapped it out with a dummy ball and given that other ball back to the guard. But it's like whatever. I I will <laughs> I will give up my Ichiro ball for the sake of making this video more compelling. And yeah, it's it's very interesting over there. So let me change gears a little bit. Um, about you know you're obviously avid ba avid baseball fan um let's go back to this this year's playoffs man how how do you feel about Clayton Kershaw he just seemed like when he gets in that when he gets in those he just can't get over that hump for being such a great pitcher like what do you have any sentiments or thoughts on that my first thought is any Dodgers fans listening you might want to step away for ah, the next he doesn't like the Dodgers 30 seconds or yeah, a minute nice um so Clayton was always cool to me going back a number of years. He threw me a few balls at the All-Star Game or maybe the Home Run Derby in San Diego in 2016. He actually recognized me and he goes, hey, you're the guy that gets all the balls <laughs> and like gave me a friendly wave. But then for some reason in 2017 in Cincinnati on Father's Day, Major League Baseball is using these commemorative baseballs with blue stitching and light blue stamping. It was like these ghostly looking yeah. balls and I was Dying to get one, paid a lot of money for seats behind the dugout. That was right before all that netting came in, so you could interact directly with the players. And in the first inning, someone hit a foul ball to the third base coach, I guess, who tossed into the dugout. Clayton had it. I was there with my Dodgers hat on. That's part of my strategy. You always dress like you're a fan of the team with the baseballs. <laughs> and I was just like, Clayton, right up here, any chance? And no one else was asking him for it. He turns like he wow. was maybe going to toss it, and he goes something like, Oh no! You already you already got like seven thousand, <laughs> and I'm like, but Clayton, it would mean so much to me. He's like, no, it wouldn't. Like you got enough. Like so, that was sort of his attitude. He wasn't really rude about it. Like right. if if guys don't like me, that's fine. I guess maybe he doesn't know that I actually give away most of my baseballs. So I went on Twitter and I I posted three tweets, basically quoting the conversation, and I finished that up by saying, sort of comparing him, saying like, you already got seven thousand of them. Like his his attitude that like uh, because i have so many another one wouldn't matter on twitter i said by that rationale his next paycheck shouldn't mean that much to him <laughs> i was just trying to like poke a little fun right oh my god did that piss people off wow. my tweets ended up being the number two story on either si.com or espn me who the hell am i like right. tweeting the, yo, you know you and are was, they know it, who you are and it was all hate so in my mind, I kind of hate Clayton. He right. didn't really do anything bad, but he was like the centerpiece of this thing that turned all negative. So I really haven't minded seeing him get shellacked in the postseason. Sorry, Dodgers fans. I have nothing against no, the Dodgers. No, I, I love Dodger Stadium. People are like, oh, how come you didn't go there this year? You hate the Dodgers. You hate Clayton. It's like, well, it's also 3,000 miles from where I live. But you went but to I Japan. Got... <laughs> speak, speak yeah, of... but I, that's, I hadn't ever done a video in yeah, Japan. No. I've yeah. done many Facts. videos at Dodger Stadium. Facts. I speak, got speaking of paychecks, is, is this your job? If this is my full-time job. YouTube and the revenue from advertisements and the videos, working with sponsors. SeatGeek has been a huge one. I've worked with them for several years now. Nice. Um, I feel like they, book put, sales. they put something out every playoff, all-star game, like best 
they actually SeatGeek, I believe, does best places to catch home run balls, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they have. I've seen that. Yeah, they have these fan guides, these stadium guides. I looked at one of your YouTube. I watched, um, like I said, I watched the YouTube one when you're at Washington, um, when you're at the Nationals Park. And if um, you guys want to check uh, Zach out in action, that's a great one to see because it shows you snagging fly balls. You know, they're throwing them to you from the outfield. You're giving them to kids. You're giving them to people away. Um, around the around the stadium, showing you how you move move around the stadium. I like how you're kind of giving a tutorial. It's it, it's pretty much. Um, but one thing that stuck out, which is pretty cool, was your glove trick, man. Explain oh, yeah. explain the explain the glove trick. So let's back this story up to about 1992, 93, Yankee Stadium, the old stadium, and still the new one has the same configuration in the outfield. The walls are you know eight to ten feet high, at least back at the old stadium. All these baseballs and BP would roll onto the warning track. They'd roll right up against the base of the wall, and then they'd just sit there. The players were too lazy to walk over from straight away right or left, and these balls would be near the foul pole, <laughs> whatever. Security didn't care. Like, no one cared about anything pre-9-11, right. you know? And they'd just sit there, and it's like, how can I get these baseballs? So I devised this device <laughs> that I call the glove trick, which is hard to understand if you're just hearing me talk about it but again if you search my name and glove trick on youtube you'll see a tutorial but i rig yeah. it on the inside with a rubber band and i prop it open with a magic marker and there's string attached to the glove and i can lower it down and actually pick up baseballs that are out of reach <laughs> and yeah. nowadays nowadays there are fans with cup tricks and and other types of devices did you patent that i did not wow yeah maybe i should have but Damn. Instead, I wrote about it in my first book and showed people how to do it, and now there's a tutorial on YouTube. Hey, man, you know what? That's called giving something back to the community. I try my best. Have you ever thrown a baseball back? Like, someone hit a homer, you catch it, ah, oh, get, throw it back. Wrigley? No, and yet I've been accused of <laughs> something out related. For you. Yeah, someone threw at Yankee Stadium a ball back that like wasn't the real ball and he like threw it back on the field too late and security accused me of providing a dummy ball to this guy because <laughs> you're just now walking around with tin in your pocket on it's, top of it's already being the damn. villain yeah it's it's weird i get accused of a lot of stuff and i just tell anybody come watch me for five seconds or five years and you're gonna just see how positive this whole thing i want to really go is. to a game with you so next year have you ever caught a ball Never, because I don't sit there. I I normally sit um, um behind first base. Oh, Mr. Fancy like Pants. That. Yeah, just like with his Rolex. Because I just I don't wear a Rolex anymore or <laughs> earrings. You okay. know what I'm saying? I, that was back. That was a few years ago. Maybe like five, almost ten years ago. Damn. Um, but yeah, man. This year in two thousand twenty twenty, my plan is to make it to as many ballparks as possible, just because. I've had I've been in cities and when baseball games are going on and cool ballparks that I think are cool, like you know the one in Minnesota. I could Target Center. I could have gone to Denver. I just see them and I'm just doing whatever I'm doing. But I'm gonna make it a part of my routine to visit stadiums. But I definitely would love to attend a game. With Let's you, hit up man. a game or three. I, like I yeah, it has and, to be. Because, and here's another question for you: mm-hmm. How would your professional athlete football skills translate to baseball could you have played baseball at the high school college pro level at what point and what position and ah, like what question. could you do what could you not can you hit can you catch well, fly balls can you judge them like well talk to me Speak you know on the I, I started playing baseball in fifth grade um in little a little league you know i made all stars fifth and sixth grade i was always an all-star till of about of course of course till about 10th grade i quit playing baseball in 10th grade because um that's when it started to get real competitive and you know it's one of those things like if if i don't know I me mean, i felt like if your dad wasn't there helping out with the team and whatnot you know what i'm saying um you know you, it was going to be hard for you i actually was put as an alternate on an all-star team for like the first time ever i'd never been an alternate and i was just like man <laughs> Forget this, man. I'm just going to go play bat. I just lost the love for baseball. But, um, I'm, yeah. I'm hurt and offended, but Yeah, I mean, I, I used to like it. Bo Jackson was my favorite player. So up to that point, I was going to be the next Bo Jackson um, for dual athlete. But, you know. I, You're still pursuing I just got that the, dream. I just got the short end of the stick. The dual athlete. Uh, and, 
Nah, not not so much anymore. But can you catch fly balls? Can you judge? Yes, him? I had twenty one um, career interceptions, but I know it's so different. Ah, you'll appreciate this story. So when I was in, I played shortstop all the way up to about seventh grade. So from like fourth grade, like for four or five years, and I was very good at shortstop. And I just felt it's not challenging anymore. I remember Ken Griffey Jr. is my favorite player. I'm gonna move to center field. Move to center field. First thing you do on a fly ball, you step back. And that's what I was doing all camp, all training, all spring. First game of the season, they had a bomb. Of course, I run forward, <laughs> and it goes over my head. Um, but once I got that one out of my system, yeah, I can – once I started going back first, then it was easy to kind of track them. But, yo, like those high, sky, towering pop-ups, it's a lot of skill, skill and It's also tough when you're in the stands – because you can't drift with the ball like an outfielder. Mm. There are steps, there are seats, there are railings, ushers, other <laughs> vendors, other fans, more at some stadiums than others. So you kind of have to pick the spot and just wait. while the ball is going up in the air and hope that you've guessed ah. right if you're moving to it. Or maybe you're just in a walkway and all you do is you're like, well, it's hit to my left. I have this space. I'm going to run in that direction. And hopefully it has the right distance. Sometimes you get lucky. But there is actually a ton of skill required for... Yeah catching these balls in the seats have you ever um had a catch interference like the guy from chicago and steve how do bartman you, yeah see i didn't even know his name but how do you feel? i had a very close call Oof. a couple of years ago at yankee stadium in the playoffs the Sheesh. alds cleveland indians i was sitting out in right field francisco lindor lindor uh hit, hit a deep fly ball it was coming pretty much right at me and i was like oh my god i'm gonna <laughs> catch this home run <laughs> And as it sort of reached the top of the arc, I was like, I don't know if this is going to be a home run. And in my mind, I was like, don't interfere, don't interfere, don't interfere. And I laid my glove on the top of the outfield wall. It's a very thick wall. It's like two feet thick. You can't tell on TV, but there is that sort of barrier separating the stands from the field. So my glove was right on top of that fat part of the wall, right where the ball was going to land. It was going to bounce on top of the wall. And I remember think, and Aaron Judge is tracking it, you know, Mr. Six Foot Seven. Right. He disappears from view. And I'm like, he's going to make a play on this. And he just came out of nowhere and jumped up and caught it a foot in front of my glove. <laughs> now, I could have easily leaned out over and made right. a chest high catch. I could have robbed Aaron Judge. Then it would have had to go to instant replay. And they would have ruled that, yes, it would have been a home run, but the fan was reaching out of the stands, and would he have caught it? And then do you still count it as a home run? Uh, you would have been banned. You wouldn't have got out of Yankee Stadium. I, I would be. We wouldn't be talking now. Yeah, like, dead. You wouldn't have got out of Yankee no. Stadium. No, and the Yankees ended up winning that game one to nothing, I believe. Jeez. And then they went on to win that series. I I could have single handedly ended the Yankees season if I catch that ball. I it's have a, probably ruled a two run homer. The Yankees lose. I have a best friend that would love. And I still got hate for to, that. <laughs> really? Oh, I got so much hate about you weren't in your seat. You jumped up and you were blocking someone, and you you tried to interfere with Judge because certain camera angles made it look like right. I was reaching right sort of over his glove. And I'm like, no. <laughs> but yeah, I think I had to block about 250 people on Twitter that night. It was really brutal. Just the personal attacks and the threats and everything else. Well, yeah, where can we find you on Twitter and elsewhere? If you know how to spell my name, I'm very easy to find. So <laughs> Zach is Z A C K, and Hample is H A M P L E. So just search me on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube is probably my biggest one. I have what's, a few books uh, out there. So I yeah, was say, what's, ZachHample.com. dot com. What's next? Uh, you got any books coming up? Anything? Um, I really out of haven't the been writing much. I wrote three books. Writing was my main drive in life for about a decade. I was writing a journal. I, I wrote, hand wrote like 15,000 pages in my Sheesh. journals. I had a blog going for almost a decade, probably wrote close to a million words on that. I also wrote three books. I was writing for minorleaguebaseball.com. And still to this day, I run a writing group in New York. That's awesome. My dad was a writer. My mom owns a bookstore. It just runs in the family. That's I started awesome. a Scrabble club in college, you know. Only got a 430 on the verbals on my SAT. <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> School, that's another story. You weren't alert that day. <laughs> no, I just didn't really care. But um, not really writing so much, but focusing entirely on video stuff. Slowing things down a little bit over the off season just so I can relax and have a life. But yeah, I'm getting some merch going. And I also run a business that I call Watch With Zach where I take people to baseball games. Like Mr. Right. Monday Night here. We could do one for free. 
I, I, it doesn't have to be. I just wanna, <laughs> I just wanna go. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, because I'm gonna let's try absolutely and, do it. I'm gonna try and hit as many stadiums as possible, and yeah, whatever one I can get on your schedule. I do it. need to know what is your official height and weight now? Right now, I am six three. Probably today, I had a nice breakfast, two twenty three. Yeah, yeah so I played at two. I played at two thirty eight. I'm going to make sure that we are not in the same row running at each other for a ball. <laughs> no, because gonna I'm be going to lose. He's going to be your blocker. Nah, I I'm going to give it to you. I'm I am gonna... currently 5'11 and about 164 pounds. You know what? I really can't really see myself you know, going to the, you know, the, the limits that you go to for a ball. <laughs> but look, I promise. I promise. One of those games that we attend, like I'm going to do the – I'm going to go all out with you. And I'm hey, if follow you, your lead. If I'll you be want your... – we can do it up for YouTube. I'll bring the videographer. Yeah. If you want to make it a whole thing. Let's do it. You're going to bring a glove or are you yeah. barehanding it? I'll bring a glove. I will bring a glove. <laughs> right. If you bring a glove, I don't ever want to hear from anybody criticizing hey, me for bringing a glove. Yo, bro, ain't nobody going to say shit to us that day in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> I like the sound of that. Word. All right. Well, that is Zach Hample. He is Mr. Monday Night, Keith Bullock. I'm Don Povia. Check us out at theoutsidegame.com and The Outside Game on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Until next time, I'm Don. Keith, peace. See you. Thanks, Zach. Pleasure.